morning, everybody. My name is Mark Bears, and I'm founder and editor in chief of Dezine, the online architecture and design magazine. And Dezine's video crew at the back here, live streaming this to the whole world. Uh, we're going to introduce onto the stage in a second that Rosanna Hu and Lyndon Neri from the Chinese architecture and design practice, Neri and Hu, who, as you all know, are guests of honor at Stockholm Furniture Fair. Uh, this year, and their, their installation, An Unfolding Village, is just outside of, of here. Um, Rosanna and Lyndon, do you want to come in onto the stage? What's going to happen is they're going to give a lecture entitled Total Design, which will explain their work and their approach to architecture and design, and then they're going to join me here for a, a short conversation where we'll pick up on some of the themes that they expressed in their work and talk about China as a design and emerging design power. So a big round of applause, everybody, for Lyndon and Rosanna. Thank, thank you, Marcus, for the kind introduction. Um, sorry, we're still trying to adjust. <laughs> I, I said that uh, this is uh, hard. Swedish individuals, people from Sweden, tends to be very tall and small head, and Chinese tends to be short and big head. So all these are, I'm having a hard time fitting into my, my big head, but I think <laughs> perhaps I uh, comfort my, myself by saying perhaps we are somewhat smarter. Okay. <laughs> So we are uh, very delighted to be here and we want to thank uh, uh, the Stockholm Furniture Fair for giving us this platform, not only this lecture, uh, but by inviting us as guests of honor and giving us this opportunity to have an installation outside, which if you haven't seen, uh, please uh, go and take a look. Um, I am Linda Neary. Uh, this is my partner, Rosanna, who uh, we are a practice base in Shanghai with a small, really small office uh, in London. I am going to show you a film here of our old office because typical of Chinese condition, we also um, was kicked out of, oh, oh the film disappeared. Okay. There's supposed to, to be a film here. There's no film. So that's okay. Let's improvise. Just look at that building then. Since we got kicked out, the film is no longer there. Um, there's nothing, really nothing. So, <laughs> well, the, the place we come from sets the stage for many of our architectural and design exploration. We want to share that condition with you today as a contextual framework from which to understand our operative modes as architects. Um, so perhaps what we're about to raise is an oversimplification of the Chinese condition. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to show you the present condition we're dealing with, confronting urban issues, uh, the rapid development and demolition of the city that we practice in, confronting rural issues, disappearing villages, and obviously, last but not the least, inheriting the remnants of China's industrial heritage and opportunity to re reutilize artifacts of excess through adaptive reuse. So urban issues. Oh, what happened? Oh, there's the film. Wow, the film just showed up. Well, can the music be louder? Sometimes when I don't feel like talking, I just figure this is a movie theater. Well, this is an old office. Uh, we just, we moved out about six months ago. Uh, we have been here for about 10 years. Um, We believe in the multidisciplinary uh, aspect of design. So if you come to our office, uh, there are product designers, there are urban planners, there's architect interior designers, uh, there are graphic designers, and there's this constant dialogue uh, within the structure uh, of our practice. This is also a way by having all this discipline to mitigate the time, uh, the way to control um, unreasonable clients, clients that wants everything so we give as a Chinese practice we say we give you everything uh, but in the process we ask for more time uh, so in many ways this is a strategy uh, on our end due to time limits I'm gonna go straight to the issues okay because this is more important urban issues so between 2000 to 2016 urban land expanded by 83 percent urban population grew 45 percent by 2020 60 percent of china's population will be living in urban areas 
that is approximately 800 million people. With urbanization changing the landscape of cities and altering the texture of daily life, it gives rise to new form of urban leisure. Um, this is Kander Nadav's image of Chongqing, and yet a lot of people over the weekend take on this urban condition and actually make it a leisurely activity, which is very interesting. Um, one can say it's sad, um, one can say it's depressing, um, yet it is a real condition. On the other issues, the rural issues, there are disappearing villages. And why is this important to us? Between 2000 to 2010, the number of villages dropped from 3.7 million to 2.6 million, an average of 300 villages lost per day. China's vernacular vill villages were formed based on Confucian family ideals where clan-based settlements created clusters of home, giving rise to traditional villages. So you can imagine if these villages disappear, a part of Chinese culture disappear with it. Yet the government catalog of 9,700 examples of intangible cultural heritage, roughly 80% of them are in the rural area. So you can see the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development has, has made this list of historic. They're cognizant and they know very well that these are important. Yet they can't control the fact, the migration of many individuals leaving rural areas to get better lives, better pay in urban condition, leaving their children for grandparents to take care of. So you can kind of see the fam uh, family structure being compromised and at the same time they're living jobs as bricklayers, as farmers, and going to city as drivers or janitors with higher pay, not much passion, and a lot of bitterness. So this image is very interesting. Only 47% of rural migrants are willing to return to their uh, farms. Only 3% among those born after 1990. Each empty chair here in the picture that you see represent an absent family member who has left the village to pursue opportunities in ur urban centers. So adaptive reuse. Many of our projects fall under the category of ad adaptive reuse and deal with local history and heritage. In much of our work, there is a recurrent theme of juxtaposing old and new, reinterpretation of local typologies, and a desire to celebrate and even elevate the mundane. In fact, we were a victim of that just a few months ago. As you see, our old office, even the office that we think we would stay forever, after 10 years, we have to move. This is the context in which Nirin who intentionally situates itself as a practice. We are constantly trying to insert meaning into our work by drawing from these contexts, both in geography and history. For that, we often find ourselves looking at the past. In other words, working the, the notion of nostalgia and many other obsessions. And today, what we want to talk about is the idea of total design as one of sessions to tackle many of the problems we're dealing with. I'm just going to show you a snippet of sort of w our installation and that's addressing the rural condition that I was addressing today. But because of time and I think you could see it in real life, I don't need to show you renderings anymore because I think um, the, real thing, self, else the, the real thing is outside. Um, so our topic today we want to center on this notion of total design. And I want to start here with Walter Gropius, quote from Scope of Total Architecture. We aim at realizing standards of excellence, not creating transient novelties. Experiment once more become the center of architecture, and that demands a broad coordinating mind, not the narrow specialist. Um, interdisciplinary is a term that is used often to describe practices that operate across design fields, ranging from architecture to interior, product, furniture, graphic, and fashion design, and even film. And in our office in Shanghai, uh, we take up almost all of that, except we haven't done fashion, we haven't done film, and we probably will never do. Um, our practice started out uh, growing from um, both Lyndon and I were uh, educated as architects, and we've uh, only worked as architect for the first uh, 10 or 15 years of our career. And then we actually started our practice designing objects in, um, and then furniture in Shanghai. 
um, and then moving on to interior, and then so, so sort of that trajectory is um, the opposite of our training. And then um, recent years, I would say the past three to five years, we have been working predominantly in the realm of architecture. But going back to kind of this notion of total design that was established by the Bauhaus and Art Nouveau movements, often associated too quickly with a particular style. I think when we, when we talk about design, we often talk about style. But we forget that these movements represented a larger collective ambition, a total design vision through means of controlling built environments from the large gestalt down to the smallest details. And you can see that in this Atelier Bauhaus um, representation for their Nora House project, and as in many of their projects, this is really, this, it's meant to look like a construction document, but those of you who are working professionals, you know that you can never really build anything uh, from a drawing like this. <clears throat> but it's supposed to represent kind of the ideals of this totalizing design, uh, from the smallest details, to the lives, to the plans, to um, the studs and the screws, but you actually don't really need to draw these, but, but it's uh, very much representation. And um, here it's a, another image by Atelier Bow Wow, uh, their representation for Made in Tokyo 2001. Um, that is documenting the anonymous or the no good of architecture, uh, in Japanese called dame architecture. And using the same representational tool and anatomical style, this image speaks to a larger urban context of how nameless standalone architecture and spaces shape cities such as Tokyo. So um, just giving us a little bit more kind of theoretical uh, discursive uh, basis to this notion of total design, Mark Wigley, in his essay, Whatever Happened to Total Design, he describes the duality and opposing impulses for exerting this control. So there are these two different controls, that, that's what he's talking about. One that is implosion towards the interior, ultimately producing hyper interiors. Um, so all the details of the architecture is uh, exemplified uh, in very, very small details, that hyper interior. And then the other one as an expansion outwards towards the urban sphere, creating a continuous interior, kind of like an like a urban interior. And we have projects that will show these qualities. So Wigley's argument is that the nature of design producing totalizing environments, whether you produce a neutral white box or sculptural forms, the end effect is totalizing, and design is never neutral. So if we look at that image up above, um, I think many of you, since you are part of the furniture industry, probably understand the impact of Eileen Gray. This, the image above shows the iconic E1027 by Eileen Gray juxtaposed with an image of the E1027 villa in which it was situated. Gray, known for her iconic furniture designs, experimented with material innovations in furniture, making in parallel with his architectural proje project. In fact, she did most of the rugs and the furniture before she did this house. And one would argue she did her first house when she was 52. But it was so complete that when Le Corbusier saw it for the first time, Le Corbusier was so shocked. And he didn't really understand why it had such an impactful um, ex uh, experience for him. And one would argue, some argued, some scholar would argue because there was this total notion of an atmosphere that Eileen Gray created, in that it was not just interior, it was not just architecture, but the rug and the furniture was all inclusive in that particular process. If you look at Maison de Vere by Pierre Chereau, Kenneth Frampton, the Colombian, Columbia scholar, asked this question, is this a furniture? Is this architecture, is this interior? A lot of architects love this project, love interior, look at this project, yet furniture designers often reference Pierre Chereau as from looking at all his details. So yet when you look at the way he approaches things, there's this conscious attention to details from the toilet design uh, to the stairway. Many of them were not just functional, they have aesthetic sensibility at the same time there is this idea that everything was thought through. So if you look at the light sink cabinet and table for Paimono Sanitarium by Alvar Alto, 
the furniture and sanitary were pieces designed all by him for this sanitarium. The space from architecture down to the furniture was designed to contribute to the healing of tuberculosis, also called the building a medical instrument. He designed custom lamps to avoid glare, silent basins to prevent splashing, even green ceilings to relax the eye with easy to clean and store furniture. It's very interesting because every time in China when we design restaurants with green color wall, they say this is really bad for the appetite. So I often use this as a reference, but obviously sanitarium is not a good one um, to use as a reference. But regardless, you can kind of see this total uh, notion of what um, Alvar Alto is trying to do. The advantage of operating in an interdisciplinary mode allows designers to exchange knowledge with other trades. Today's construction in industry in Asia and China in particular provides designers with access to raw materials, suppliers and manufacturers, many of whom are willing to test new methods of production. And so as architects, we actually take opportunity and this opportunity. But aside from the economic agency, we are also interested in the cultural agency that comes with em embracing total design. For our projects in China, it is often unaffordable to import products from abroad. Maybe easier now, but less when we started. So we often have to employ local uh, construction, technology, and manufacturing to deal with it. But in the process, the last 15 years, it actually had um, help us as a practice. But more importantly, it is a way to have this total control. As designers and architects, we like to do this. So although it sounds like a fallacy, but for us, it is a way to be able to mitigate um, the present, uh, not just um, speed condition that we're dealing with um, in the city we practice. So the first project we're going to show uh, is located in Beijing. It's called The Garage, and of course, um, this is a project that embraces uh, the ideals of total design, but as well as uh, kind of this urban renewal um, um, issue that Lyndon was talking about. It's located in um, the heart of Beijing, really, very close to the Temple of Earth. I think most of you who have been to Beijing, you know the Temple of Heaven, and everyone goes there uh, when they go to Beijing, but very few people know that there's actually on the other side a Temple of Earth. And really, um, interestingly, this is also um, a city that has about 7 million vehicles, um, a city of 26 inhabitants and 7 million vehicles being trapped in a car in Beijing's notorious traffic is a compulsory experience whenever you go to the city. And when the client came to us, we thought he was um, uh, mad because this was an old uh, missile factory. So they actually uh, made missiles in, in these buildings and he wanted to turn this into a uh, garage, not the kind that you park, uh, but the kind that you repair. Um, and not only was this going to be a garage, but we thought uh, the reason why we took the project is, of course, the, I think, you know, um, designing for auto repair center is very interesting for us. We've never done it. But more importantly, uh, the kind of program that the client had wanted to insert into this garage was really quite um, profound. He wanted um, to have a cafe. There's going to be um, an event center and even... Uh, cultural event center and also uh, uh, some kind of a design gallery, design and art gallery. So we started rethinking kind of, you know, what can this uh, addition be? And because it's going to be um, a, uh, a there, there's going to be a restructure um, of the original building. And uh, kind of using that um, uh, industrial language uh, of the metal, we created both the garage um, as well as the cafe space um, with uh, basically all uh, customized furniture uh, from the um, from all the offices to uh, the shelving to the lights uh, as well as to the graphics and there's a short film showing this Can the music go 
the Apple music is actually very important when we talk about total design because Rosanna will describe um, she's the musical one in the partnership I'm not I'm tone deaf so that this is very important for her do you want to explain the music? well the this music is an original recording actually made for um, uh, the artist uh, Chen Sa who is a, a Chinese pianist um, who um, is producing actually her own uh, recording and one of the first performance uh, that she did was was with this music was at Design Republic so there's kind of that association of the cultural element of this kind of project I don't know how many of you in this room while you're watching this film uh, were here two years ago when we gave a lecture uh, so a few, okay. Well, not a lot, actually, uh, interestingly enough, because what we did was we're just showing two of those projects uh, that we showed two years ago, and we're showing all new projects. Um, that also maybe is an indication of the speed in which where we are. Uh, but we, for those of you that wanted to see some of our older projects, um, we're not showing them, but you can come up to us after. And in case you have more questions about this project, the client is actually sitting right here <laughs> up front, so you can, you can ask him. <laughs> For the sake of time, we're going to go to our second project because we're showing you um, eight projects. And there's also some demands uh, from the furniture industry to show us, to show the crowd some of our furniture design. So this is a project that many of you are familiar with, and we showed this um, two years ago, and we were here eight years ago. A Singaporean developer, a hotelier, and a Chinese developer came, and there was a phone call to our office. You have to remember, at that time, we were doing a lot of product design and a lot of interiors, even though we were trained as architects. So when someone asked me, Lyndon, are you interested in doing a project on the bun? I said, is it an interior project? They go, no, it's an architecture project. You don't say no to those kind of commission. Of course, the egotistical side of me thought that perhaps of the 33 historical building, I get to demolish one and do one of them. I was wrong, because this was the building <laughs> they gave to me. So first, you can imagine how startled I was, and I was shocked when given this particular condition. But the second request, was even more shocking. The second request was for us to do, to demolish this building and to do Mayfair London. I was like, we are in Shanghai, why do we want to do Mayfair London? Nothing personal against London, Marcus, your hometown. But I'm, Mayfair just doesn't make sense, but you never say no to a client. So I said, let me think about it uh, inside my, um, my head, obviously, I said, absolutely not. Over my weather decomposed body, will I ever do a Mayfair London? So I went back and said, perhaps we should keep a lot of these because it will save you a lot of money. And when you tell that to Chinese clients, they naturally approve. So they say, sure, why don't we keep this? Because it's going to save us a lot of money. Obviously, at the end, it did not save them a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> so you can imagine the sketches. Some of them are very different uh, from what it is now. Those are our original sketches. Um, we were intrigued by Calvino's quote, arriving at each new city, the traveler finds again a pass of his that he did not know he had. The foreignness of what you no longer are or no longer possess lies in wait for you in foreign, unpossessed places. And sometimes, as a local living in Shanghai for many years, it takes someone from the outside to tell us the good things about the everyday, the mundane, and the ordinary. And that happens here as well in Stockholm. Sometimes it takes a foreigner to come and tell you what is good about this city. Definitely not the snow. But having said that, so we decided that this hotel perhaps should not be for a tourist, that it should be for a traveler. The idea of ce celebrating people washing their hair, brushing their teeth, uh, eating on the sidewalk, hanging their clothes, and you can imagine how startled my client was. You are going to showcase the essence of what Shanghai is, uh, which is the difference between a traveler and a tourist. Tourists comes in and have a checklist of what they want to see, 
and then they leave town and they think it's like someone who's going to a museum and they don't really see the show but they go to the bookstore and buy the monograph and they said okay I have seen the show uh, it's rather pathetic but that's the current condition that we lived in um, and so to celebrate the idea of this tension of public and private uh, people seeing each other. I mean, if, if you walk along the lane houses in Shanghai, you actually pe see people cooking, um, brushing their teeth, uh, bathing sometimes in their toilet. Uh, it's not perverse. It's not being uh, a pervert. But the idea is this is a real condition, neighborhood condition. We live in one of those lane houses. And sometimes I come out of, a, I come out of my bedroom going to um, uh, my bathroom, and I have this big piece of glass thing and three meters away is a um, uh, grandmother who cooks every morning so if I don't put my curtain if I don't um, close, close my curtain they see me completely naked um, and it's it's a it's a real condition and so when she, she asks when she comes and sees me in the community and tells me that I have gained weight I know what she means <laughs> um, so with these kind of condition we decided so initially they were really worried, but then they realized that perhaps uh, this was something that they could explore. So it was 19 rooms, and it was exploring issues on public and private, old and new, um, the idea of what it is to travel through what we call a vertical uh, lane house. Um, so I want to show you different images uh, of this particular relic uh, that we kept intact. In fact, that's the cheapest room because when you checked in, that's the bedroom. Um, so be warned, if you go into this, it's still going strong after eight years, um, with some of them with views, some of them do not have views, so you can kind of see um, different rooms, looking at other rooms. Uh, sectionally, from the restaurant, you actually see bedrooms, so there's no need for artwork, I argue, to the client, and they bought it. Um, this is the skylight looking up, these were remnant. It was once an opium den, or a, a warehouse, really, for uh, a number of people. But people, uh, opium storage, so people would have different stairways that lead you up. Uh, so when the cops come or the security forces, they could go to different places. So we kept all that uh, intact. You can kind of see all these stairway. Uh, in fact, the photographer might be in this room. Um, so that is not a mirror. That is the bed across. So parents, if you have kids and you want to come visit Shanghai and you want to control them, this is the best way to do. Rent these two rooms. You could look down where that slit is, and that's the restaurant. So you become either the artwork or be part uh, of the social community down below. So these are recycled uh, wood from above, from a decaying roof. Um, and so you see some of these images. But I'll show you the movie. And I think it was really after um, we finished the project and the reception that we got from the design world, as well as the urban uh, planning committee, they realized that this type of building could actually be somewhat preserved. Uh, unlike, I think, uh, some of the officials thinking that you know only the um, valuable buildings, the historic buildings that they deem valuable, uh, should be. Preserved. So I think uh, this project alone actually has brought attention to uh, those type of issues uh, wherein, you know, urban memory should be preserved, but who is to judge what is valid and what is not valid, what has value and what has not value. And so this project uh, for us was really quite interesting, particularly on that front, is kind of, you know, us originally taking or in a way saving a building that the city thought was not worth saving and actually brought it uh, uh, or, or design, through design and through um, kind of a, an idea of reflective nostalgia and brought that building towards the future. So you have to realize it's not just a government official, even my parents did not understand. So this was eight years ago and you have to remember this was in many ways our first architectural project. So when my parents came and saw this building for the first time, the first question from my mother that came out of her mouth was, is this project complete? And I said, yes, it is complete. And of course, the second question was, did the client pay you? And uh, I said, yeah, the client paid me in full. 
Uh, and so my mother proceeded to tell me, it's either you're a genius or the client's really stupid. So even your own mother does not understand you. But sometimes you have to do what you think um, is important. And if you try to please many of government officials or even your own parents at the expense of your conviction, I think ultimately you're going to be disappointed. So what was the best part of this was two years after this was built, the tourism board, as Rosanna was uh, telling you, Shanghai Tourism Board used this image uh, as the front cover um, to lure tourists to come to Shanghai. So when that happened, we realized that perhaps we have cracked a little bit um, within the government sector. They finally understand, perhaps not completely, they just realized the popularity of this particular space. A lot of the design decisions actually happen during site visits. So during construction, when we go visit, we would sometimes ask them to stop constructing, stop constructing um, the wall or um, something that had already been in our drawing because uh, we thought, well, it's probably better to preserve some of these layers, especially in the atrium. So if you've been there, there are all these layers of time that you can see, probably five, six different layers of plaster, of wallpaper, of tiles, and, and kind of leaving it as is um, were really important for us. So this next project um, is the new Shanghai Theater. It's located in a very busy part of Shanghai in the original French concession. And you can see from this original uh, facade that it's occupying a site of a former theater dating back in the 1930s. And this was one of the, um, it, the in Chinese, it's, it's named uh, Shanghai Da Xi Yuan. So it's a grand theater, even though uh, what you saw, the facade didn't look that grand. Um, but there were many notable performances at the time. And the existing building had undergone a series of renovation over the decades, which um, uh, this is from the 1990s, and then this was 2007. So obviously when we saw this facade, this is not the time for us to uh, save this or to preserve this. And so the resulting building, uh, as we found it, had become um, like this one is a pastiche of various styles. And so from the street, um, what we wanted to do is to have the building read as a heavy stone, kind of bringing back that uh, old world grace uh, from the original uh, kind of great, uh, uh, understated and, and very quiet uh, facade. And so using stone and bringing a volume that hovers just above the ground level and lodging firmly between its neighbors uh, announces a, a, a certain understated presence. And encased entirely in stone, this is the end result, the upper two floors relinquish any outwardly visible openings in favor of vertically carved apertures. And here the drawing um, um, inspiring from, uh, in, drawing inspiration from the theatrical acts uh, which takes place within, the carved spaces of the interior and the exterior atriums were conceptualized as a series of dramatic scenes. So in a way, you see the architecture and the building playing this act of light and shadow, of rain and uh, height. Um, and when the sun comes, it, it's really quite beautiful. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have done, I think, here, which exemplifies this ideal of total design where Mark, Mark Wigley talks about this continuous interior coming, kind of spilling out of the architecture into the streets, uh, making this kind of an urban interior um, is through here, you can see kind of the sight line of where uh, the mar uh, where it demarcates where the building um, red line should be, and we actually open it up so that uh, cars now want to park there because it looks like it's part of this it's part of the street. So it's this area where people actually um, can feel like they are. Uh, this theater is part of the community. It's part of the sidewalk. The sidewalk opens up to uh, kind of that. Um, front lobby of the theater. So the theater was a block box, so you can imagine when we were asked to do a theater, um, and when the government called us, when you work for the government, the fee obviously is controlled, 
I'm not going to say it's low, it's controlled, very similar to Stockholm probably. Uh, I tried to see a doctor here, they said you might have to wait in line because even though it's free, so I'm like, whoa, this is dangerous, what if happens, what if I uh, die waiting? But that's just what that happens, but uh, in China, m many of that condition, I can kind of relate. Uh, so what we did was, since the fee was fixed, or for a better word, a little bit on the meager side, I said, why don't and, and when we went in also, we were actually, it was a block box. So they said, we don't really need the theater. The theater is already designed. All you need to do is to design this particular space in between. Um, and as architects, we thought, why not? And so since the fee was rather meager, we said we should give back part of this space to the public. That's the reason why that front part, uh, we open up uh, to the public. And these are bronze uh, walls that is supposed to evoke kind of this curtain call uh, from within, kind of bringing that curtain aspect out into uh, the lobby space. So the next three projects is going to go fast. They're unbuilt work. We usually don't present unbuilt work, but everyone there is uh, in my Instagram account. Uh, last night alone, I must have gotten 30 messages, and that's a lot for me, personal messages, not to the office, asking us to show um, some of our current work, uh, work that is under construction. Um, so we're going to quickly show you uh, a num three projects uh, that's unbuilt, and then we're going to go back to two built projects. Um, this is an ancestral hall, um, a typology that's interesting that probably is not seen anywhere, perhaps with the exception of Japan, Korea, and China. Um, and it is a place wherein you go back and remember your ancestor, uh, or perhaps you worship them um, every once a year or twice a year and you go back to these kind of places. So this is up uh, north of uh, Beijing. Uh, and this client's interesting. Uh, he's developing this whole development uh, and he's doing three uh, public spaces. One is an ancestral hall, the other one is a small museum and the other one a tea house. Um, one by Open Architecture and the other one by um, um, Liu Yitzhen to, to do uh, many of these different public spaces to cater to the community um, setting within. So what we did was we created uh, this whole sectional, the, the traditional notion of an ancestral hall from going from one space to another, and so you can kind of see the hierarchy of spaces. We have made sure that the tradition of this ancestral hall is kept, uh, and the, it's the interpretation of it that we start to change. It's set within the terrain of a very rough mountain. Um, actually, it's very close to the tail end of the Great Wall. So it's very interesting uh, to be in this particular place. So you see some of these sections uh, that we're showing you. Um, and intentionally, if you look at sort of programmatically, um, and in terms of its rhythm, I think there's a, there's a perhaps traditional setting, and yet it's our interpretation of that circulation around that space, um, creating, celebrating the roof, and making it a little bit deeper than usual, using local typologies and material uh, to play on uh, this. Obviously, this is that fi finality when you co go in and uh, pay homage to your ancestor. This next project is for the, actually the same client, uh, but it's uh, off in a kind of a vacation resort island uh, where he has uh, established many um, resort houses. And this is somewhat urban, um, but um, sort of in between urban and, and, and suburbia. And so for us, um, it was really interesting because the program we had helped conceptualize with the client, and this became kind of the, the, the total design idea of um, us starting from, 
from scratch, uh, uh, exploring with the client what it is that this building should be. And so uh, it started out as a box and then kind of bringing people into the spectacle and journey of discovery, uh, design, and art. And so this became kind of an art gallery um, with the exhibition space, with uh, kind of um, these, uh, this center courtyard is important because it's the one where it's going to contain uh, most of the event, uh, e events that happens, uh, as well as, you know, housing different shows, fashion shows, uh, design shows, uh, and then circumventing, there's a circulation uh, around it wherein you can have uh, a small gallery and then you can also have people who walk around and kind of peek down at what's happening down below. And uh, architecturally, it's a, it's kind of a concrete box that has different uh, holes that opens out to the street and it's made out of um, concrete. Pieces, panels of uh, precast concrete. So this will open um, in March this year, actually April. So some of the construction photos uh, all the precast concrete that Rosanna was talking about, the public spaces down below, and uh, the idea of all the restaurants uh, and the dining venue down below for the community. Um, it was interesting because the client wanted, in a Mediterranean setting, the development was full of Mediterranean houses, that he wanted something that you can come back on and played on the materiality of the local culture, which is kind of interesting um, for him to feel. So these are some of the construction photo. Um, the third project is probably one of the largest in our office. Uh, we st it's also uh, outside of um, about three hours by plane um, from Shanghai. And it's interesting because in Zento, the idea of land, the blurring of the land um, and architecture is very much seen in many of their architecture. So we decided as we were approached and given this particular site, to start blurring the landscape with the architecture, thinking back on the typology and the precedents that you just saw on that images. We thought, what if we start playing on this idea of creating landform building? Um, and the idea of this journey, uh, if you look at Suzo Gardens even, um, many of the journey and the narrative deals with the idea that you are within that garden. So there are restrictions uh, on the guidelines um, so what we did was what we went to the planning board and we said, what if we take this demarcating line and kind of merge them together? And so there's a real blurring between landscape uh, and architecture, and you can kind of see. Uh, so this just, um, these are some of the images uh, that just passed planning, by the way. So we're kind of excited. Um, it's an entire block. It's, it's a little bit crazy, uh, but it's this landform uh, structure that comes out so many ways. Is it a forest? Is it architecture? Is it landscape? Uh, is it interior? So these are some of the images and some of the model. I think one of the model is out there. You should see a snippet of it. Uh, so it's a hotel. It's an office space. It's a number. It's really uh, a whole block uh, of the particular uh, city. So you see snippets of it. Um, uh, we have about 10, less than 10 more minutes. 15. Yeah, okay, so, so this one, I think we will also very quickly just go uh, straight to the film. It's in Suzhou. Suzhou is known as a um, very important cultural center for uh, Chinese uh, antiquity, and it's also where the gardens are from. But this location is actually close to a lake, uh, a lake that is famous for crabs, Yangchenghu. And this is part of a development. Um, and interestingly, I think for us, uh, the significance of this project lies that uh, it's it's kind of a revival of a typology that is uh, very rarely seen in modern Chinese architecture. This is a chapel, a place of worship, and as you know, there is no freedom of worship in China, and let alone even designing a building for worship. So. Um, we conceptualize this project as, of course, a chapel in uh, the middle, but uh, kind of working uh, towards this idea of maybe that a lot of the visitors and audience who want to come to this worship place may not want to be in the center. They may not want to participate in the act of worship. So we created this periphery space um, wherein people can come to and have access and have uh, visibility to what's happening in the worship ground, but they are not participating. So you will see uh, later on that you know this uh, peripheral uh, kind of 
uh, stair staircase, uh, and it's a very enlarged staircase uh, that acts as this um, kind of an appendage to the chapel. And another thing that is uh, important here are all the reclaimed bricks that we have used uh, to form this um, kind of landscape and bridge that leads you up to towards the, the, uh, the, the entry of the chapel. So this recycled, these recycled bricks were taken from 12 different towns around the area from demolished buildings. Uh, so in many ways, this, the base that is, is holding this particular lantern is a representation of the community around. So this is kind of, you know, the, um, the mezzanine area has that periphery where you can walk around and be engaged and not completely engaged in the act of worship. And then kind of the, the third layer of the stairs, um, you will see pretty soon. And that's where all those openings are from. Um, uh, they, they offer kind of this uh, viewing of the activity the, that happens in the chapel, but you don't have to take part in it. So this is the pathway from the outside because it's in different elevations. Uh, leading to the lake so when you come in this path actually continues so you see a glimpse of the chapel um, if you are not very comfortable with the idea of a congregation uh, it allows you to have a snippet uh, of what is beyond um, and we have had school children come in here or people in even in their 20s that come in initially would be intimidated to come into this congregation or space of congregation they would walk around uh, the pathway before entering the space of assembly the last project we want to show uh, before maybe we go through a number of products design later but um, is what we call the wall Qingpu uh, Yangzhou retreat uh, Yangzhou is about three hours by train from Shanghai the client came to us uh, with a site that was filled with garbage. Literally, this was all uh, garbage, uh, and this was in disarray. Um, he argued, and I think rightfully so, that the rural area and some of these rural destinations should be preserved. When we talked about the 80% of rural areas uh, that have been in neglect, this is one of them. Um, and he argued that it can't just be the Great Wall, the Summer Palace, um, or the Forbidden City that the government takes care of, but 80% of the small uh, line destinations that's outside of the city along the Silver Lake in different regions, uh, especially in the Jiangsu area, needs to also be taken care of. So he employed people like Kengo Kuma, Su Fujimoto, and a number of Chinese architects to help him on this endeavor. Um, and so we were fortunate enough, uh, so we start looking into this, the context of the local uh, culture of that particular area. You have to remember, we, can't, uh, we have to keep the footprint of the building. The building itself can be demolished because it was already in bad shape, but the footprint of them needs to change. So what we did was we took on the idea of what happens if we take on the the wall and the alleyway that is so pre uh, predominant in this particular area and apply this gridded wall on a rather uh, a plot with buildings that are all over the place. There was no order, no matter what you do with the architecture. So we decided to create this wall, both contextually, historically, and at the same time as an architectural strategy to tie the whole space together. This is a resort. There's only 19 rooms in here. Um, and so you can kind of see the floor plan. If you look at the building, they're not aligned, but the grid itself allows for it uh, to be aligned. So this was done, this was a construction photo about six months ago, so the vegetation is not full yet, but if you go now, it's um, co completely lush. So this is the theater uh, part of it. There's the public component. You could go up along these walls. This wall leads you to different rooms, but at the same time, there are also vantage points so that you can see the Silver Lake beyond. 
uh, bricks are all recycled from the same area, done in different and articulated in different way. This is the reception area. Um, as you check in, um, this is the reception interior, some of the interior of the rooms, and you can kind of see some of the images I'm going to show you. We were allowed to do three smaller buildings outside of the gridded condition, and we took advantage of it by uh, creating sensitive buildings. Music can be louder, and I'll just talk over it. You can't hear the music. So this was completed about six months ago. Um, and again, it came with a lot of challenges, because uh, at one point, uh, the wall costs a lot of money, so the client came to me and said, do we really need the wall? And all we did was I had to fly over to convince him that without the wall, uh, part of that context that we were talking about within that region is no longer relevant, so we have to start all over again. Yeah, and in a way, I think by keeping the wall, even though these walls are rigid and they kind of demarcate the boundaries, uh, in a way, by keeping the wall, you have uh, an opportunity to blur the boundaries of uh, inside and outside because then these walls are, um, they, they kind of mark the outdoor spaces that engage the interior. And so even though your rooms are interiorized, once you come out, uh, you still have the gridded wall that kind of secures you in that uh, in that architecture in that total architecture and you don't feel lost uh, and not only can you walk uh, in between the walls you can walk above the walls so you can gain like a different um, different vent vantage point and different horizon uh, for this project because of this project he's managed to obtain eight more sites uh, the government had allowed him uh, to have eight more sites um, all over China, uh, one of them in Xiamen with one of those two low, uh, the rounded sort of courtyard houses. Um, he's developing it into another hotel. Uh, by doing this, he argues that people should come to China and understand all these cultural destinations, places that might have been uh, ignored in the past, um, and at the same time, it brings life to rural conditions that's very important to the civilization and the culture uh, of the country. products, uh, furniture and lighting for different brands uh, all over the world. For this project, everything, I think, uh, other than a, a few cases, most of the products are designed uh, for, custom designed for this project and made in this village or around the village. So the crafts are probably rougher, uh, the details, they could not make them very refined, but it actually is much more in keeping with the total context of the project. Spada piece that they could afford. But I made them promise not to copy it. So, Luis, if you're in this room, don't worry. He's right there. So three years ago, we've made a conscious effort to do more projects in the rural area. 
economically it's not not as um, a smart decision perhaps uh, so my managing director is always worried uh, that we would go bankrupt any day uh, but I think for Rosanna and myself it's important that uh, we do projects that will have significant meaning and that architecture actually does become a conduit um, not just for the community at large but for architects and product designers and interior designers to be able to use their trade um, to facilitate and help different society that is in jeopardy of survival. By, by creating jobs, you can imagine people, former bricklayers, um, people who are farmers, craftsmen, they can come back uh, to places, their hometown, and be with their children at the same time, be proud of what they do. That's the reason why we have that installation outside uh, dealing with that particular issue. Um, I'm just going to keep this here, Marcus, because I think it's one hour is up. Uh, for those of you that are interested in our furniture design, that was supposed to be the next lecture, but we'll do that maybe next time or later if you're interested, we could flip through it rather fast. Thank you very much. Okay, I need water. So first, first, of all, first of all, I want to ask you about the very fact that you're here as guests of honor. We were talking beforehand about you were also guests of honor at IDS in Toronto. And I've noticed that both yourselves and, and other architects and designers from China are starting to get a lot more attention at the design fairs in the West. What's going on there? Is it because we've, um, we've suddenly belatedly discovered this pool of talent or is there a more of an economic reason behind that? I think it's both, um, but largely it's also curiosity. I feel that the West um, has always been very curious about the progress in China and um, in some ways the creativity of China kind of defies all notion uh, of the past, that China is a place of copying um, and indeed there is still a problem of a lot of copies, but I think there's a, a resurgence of um, a new generation of creatives who are doing um, amazing work exploring issues, um, exploring materials, and working with technology, and really, I think, is going to change um, the face of China. And it's going to change or is already changing? I think that's for, for, for you to judge and but, tell but, us. But, but I think, Marcus, that's just part of history, no? if you think about it. Because in the 50s, when Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe um, had an opportunity to build in America, it's not because they didn't want to practice in Germany. They did, but the opportunity was in America. So they realized that there was no future in Europe at that time. So they went to America and, you know, you, you see Seagram Building, you see Farnsworth House, considered classic today. Um, it's an economic opportunity. It's not so much that there were talents in there. When you're given an opportunity in a particular region, naturally, um, arch architects, product designers, and interior designers get to experiment and explore. China is at the stage when the economic uh, forces are coming in. So naturally, people like us and all our friends and colleagues have this opportunity to practice. Are we better? No. Are we more talented? Absolutely not. We just have the opportunity to experiment. If that same economic forces was in Stockholm or was it in Copenhagen, you will see many great designers coming out of this place. So. That's the reason why people like Zaha Hadid, that's why people like Reb goes to those regions because there's work in there and there's nothing to do with the fact that there's more appreciation of design, but I think economy does have a big factor. So everyone's just following the money? Uh, definitely. I mean, you can't, hate to say this, but that's a reality. And all of the, a lot of the references you gave in your talk were to um, Eileen Gray, Mark Wigley, Gropius and things like that. So there's a very Western cultural framework in which you started to work. Um, do you feel like you're becoming more Chinese now? Um, that's a really good question, but I, I think we have to also realize where the discipline started. I think the discipline of architecture, and the, in a way, the discipline of design, discipline of architecture is created in the West. Um, there are traditions of building, traditions of craftspeople, traditions of um, um, carpentry, 
in Japan and in China, but it's not the same discipline um, as we know it today that we call architecture. So I think if you go back to that disciplinarian notion, uh, and if you have to use kind of you know theory and um, and pedagogy to explain certain things. Um, many of us who are also educated in the West, we kind of rely on those things to explain uh, certain aspects of our design. And of course, what we would like to do more is to spend more time in kind of understanding uh, philosophies and notions of a aesthetic from you know the Eastern culture, which we don't really have a very strong foundation on and we don't want to pretend to be. But if we do have the time, then I think what would be really interesting is the marriage of those two is that you know if you can bring kind of the Western disciplinarian uh, theory and then the Eastern philosophies, I think you know hopefully this generation or the next generation will be able to produce something profound for us to learn from. But it's also a natural process. I don't want to hark back on the economic and be so practical about the process. Eileen Gray gets to experiment because there was extra money in the place where she was. Le Corbusier managed to experiment many different things and convince the Indian government when the government is involved, they had the most money, but it was because he had so many ideas while he was in Switzerland and in France to be able to build in Amnibad and be able to convince the Indian government to do so. The last 50 years, the, the, the Chinese community, m many of which were struggling to even survive, let alone have time to think. Uh, the idea of, you, you understand that the whole notion of scholarly work was not present for a, sh for a number of, I won't call it dark years, but a number of years wherein it was not seen as important. And so naturally, uh, um, things about architecture and the ideology of architecture, it's a luxury, Marcus. It's not um, part of that every day. Uh, and so many of the things we quoted on, you can kind of tell is rather period. Mark Quigley, uh, perhaps in the 80s or the 90s, because that was when the American thought on theory came about, you know, 50s for uh, Eileen Gray. Uh, and in the early 1920s, you could also see other uh, thought provokers, both in architecture and philosophy. But I think there's also a time lag, right? I mean, you, um, you first have a problem, uh, and then the design uh, industry resolves that problem through design, and so there's the practice of design, and then I think there's a there's a there's a uh, time lag wherein that design work is then critiqued and reviewed and talked about, and and then theories come out derive are derived out of those design work, and then so that's why I think we we reference them, we use them because that has already uh, been a past and that past has been studied. Whereas what's happening right now, what is currently going on right now in China, creatively speaking, I think you know, we haven't had the, the, the time lag to really be self-critical and to uh, derive a whole theory. But things are moving faster because it was only, what, three or four years ago that I was with you guys in Shanghai, and Lyndon, you, you uttered this memorable phrase, it's like, architects in China are lost. They don't know what to do. They, 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 a, a lot of your generation, you were educated in the West, you went back to China, things moved so fast, and it was like, oh my God. But we spoke about it again last year, and you're like, aha, but it's not like that anymore. Already it moved mm -hmm. forward. So mm. a year on from that conversation, how much further have things gone? Yeah, it actually scares me. Um, <laughs> I was always telling Rosanna, if we didn't start our practice about 14 years ago in Shanghai, I don't think we stand a chance today. There's so many young architects, young interior designers, young product designers that are doing amazing work. I think um, before 15 years ago, we did restaurants, we did cafe, and there was no, absolutely no competition. Uh, we would go in and no one even knew what a product designer's uh, role was. So we would be the interior designer and then they say, oh, facade, do you, you want to change the facade? Sure, we became the architect. Oh, you want to do the furniture? We can't afford furniture. Can you do custom furniture? We end up doing the, oh, how about the menu? Can you do the graphics as well? Um, so in many ways, this whole interdisciplinary was a revelation on our end. If we were to do it today, we don't stand a chance, Marcus. It came out of the market, the, the needs, and then we basically just um, fulfill the needs of their clients. There, was so, there are so many people now that are, that are traveling everywhere. Um, people who are educated. I mean, we were just um, 
Recently, last fall, we were teaching at Yale Architecture School, and the graduate program over there, the uh, number of Chinese students um, speaking fluent English and Chinese is outstanding. And the design quality that's coming out of um, that department, that school, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking just Harvard, I'm talking about ETH, I'm talking about AA, I'm talking about Harvard, I'm talking about Princeton. All these top schools are inundated with curious, thirsty people who know that once they have this foundation, they can go back to a country that will allow them to experiment, that will have many opportunities to make all their dreams a realization. One of the big things that people say about China, and maybe this is a cliche, is that the, the system there doesn't encourage original thought that you learn by copying the master. So you're saying that still today the Chinese have to, to leave China to get that kind of open-ended education and then go back? Or is the education system itself I, I changing? I think that will change. That's slowly changing, I think. Um, I don't know to, ex to what extent, how fast it is going, the educational sector, because you have to remember all these people that are coming back, our generation, are also teaching. They're now all teaching um, in Tsinghua and you know, in Tongji. So a lot of them, the top architecture schools, are now taught by a number of returnees. Mm -hmm. And many schools are establishing their presence in China. And we were talking about your, your influences earlier. Uh, and also, I think Rem Kolha has pointed out that the only significant architectural movement that didn't come from the West was the Japanese metabolist. Do you think that, that China could add to the conversation at some point soon. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Is it already definable? Or it, it, it's not definable. I think mm -hmm. it, it is bubbling. Yeah. Um, and what, would, what, what direction is it going in? Can you? I don't know. We feel the heat from that bubble, yeah. but I don't know what it is. Um, and, but uh, I do, because we're very critical at our work, and we're really depressed. We look at each other sometimes, and we actually want to stop our practice, because we realize we have not invented a lot of things. No, the, really, I think if, um, if you've seen what we have seen and some of the encounters that, that, that we have seen through the young generation, I think it's, it's, we're really, really impressed. And could it perhaps come somehow out of this, this quandary of the, the, the urbanization and the problems that leaves behind in the countryside? Because you, you said yourselves, you've started to ad address the countryside actively. Is that part of the dynamic or is it a, a separate from uh, that? In, in a big way, because the communal aspect of... I'm not... We're not suggesting, the installation is not suggesting that that is a, a model that you have to replicate. What we're trying to address with that installation is for us to understand, and it's not just a China condition, it's a global condition, the essence of communal living. And oftentimes developers would just build buildings and then slap Starbucks in a restaurant, they call that community. That is not a community. Um, that's just a commercial venture. So I really understand the need of the community. And, and I know it is hard. Uh, perhaps it's a very 60s thought and people have done that before. Uh, but I think it's, it's important that this idea of community that we see in villages, the gossips uh, that I was talking to you about are prevalent. Yeah, because this, re this reveals an interesting duality because your installation highlights the fact that as not just China, but the West has urbanized as well, Africa is urbanizing. So traditions from the village that have lasted for thousands of years, social traditions, cohesion, family structures are getting lost. People are moving to the cities because opportunities with work largely but then they don't have the family structures, they don't have the moral structures, all that falls apart. We've created a kind of artificial substitute for that, often with social media and, and things like that, but it's getting us into all kinds of trouble, isn't it? So there are, there are two separate conditions sort of reversing away from each other. As architects, how can you address either of those? You mentioned before about um, um, we're building, what was the, the vertical graveyards or something yes. like that. So, so an apartment block becomes somewhere where people go to sleep, but it doesn't really solve a lot of the other. Yeah, needs. we're, we're, I was telling Marcus we're building vertical graveyards because people. We as a society, not, not you. Yeah, uh, pe <laughs> people, uh, people just build, uh, people have 20 square meter houses. I mean, literally, you're just going in to sleep and you're paying a lot of money for this vertical. Um, graveyard um, and in, in many ways there's really no life to it you're constantly working and you're just sleeping and 
in China it's even worse because in major city people just come in and speculatively buy apartments hoping to flip it in a year or two years time so you see buildings coming in and what Rosanna commonly call it ghost towns because it's really empty and you visit it once a year to clean it uh, and hoping that you can resell it in a year for a major profit so that's no different from a cemetery you know do you think you t we're talking about building ghost towns as physical things but do you think we're also building ghost societies do you think that urban life is is kind of hollow compared to the the richness of life in the village i mean you often think about village life and on the one hand the grandmother listening to the gossip and then repeating it that's kind of fake news isn't it that can be really small town poison that people want to get away from but on the other hand everyone knew the rules everyone respected grandma do you think that we're also building ghost societies I, I think so I think we've gone to a point where in um, things are subtech and I know this whole thing about being independent I was in um, someone was interviewing us yesterday and I said it's interesting because in the West people would take um, I can't I can't imagine this but um, in the West it's very common when your parents is older to send them out to elderly homes and people call it some modern condition I'm not so sure if it's a modern condition um, so is this humanitarian Marcus I'm not sure uh, to let them live in an elderly home where in there's no relationship and you feel guilty you come once every six months to visit and yet there's a lot of wisdom in that old woman and old man that have taken care of you and your children yeah um, and and so that relationship perhaps this gossipy thing is is a little bit poisonous but I think there needs to be a balance but we replaced that with Facebook which is turning out to be even more poisonous Co as correct. we learned in the last and, and you're in your also. room and you do all this nasty thing close your loom you're in your little graveyard and you do really bitter things no sense of responsibility you pose things without um, really authorship and you can hide away um, without a sense of responsibility of what you're saying. I think it's also that, um, you know, architecture has lost its agency to uh, make greater impact than, than who they think, what they think they, they could, or um, compared to definitely the early modernist. I think right now we're grappling with, you know, when we talk about that architects are lost, they're not just lost in China, I think they're lost all over the world. Um, you know, where is architecture going? Where is design going? And the relevance that it, it can actually add to our society and add to our everyday, add to the world. It, what is it? It's definitely not color or form or patterns. It's not the shapes uh, that, you know, we, we think define design. It's a lot more than that. And, and is it in design or is it in other agencies that ought to work with design to uh, instill real changes? you know, working with policy, working with, um, I mean, a, you know, a whole slew of different disciplines. In a way, and definitely in the West, it goes back to what we were saying before about following the money, as when the state stopped being the major provider of work for architects, particularly in Anglo-Saxon cultures, then architects had to follow the money. So the money was the private developers, the high-rise guys, the resort people, and so on and so forth. But what is the relationship between people like you and the state in China? Because we hear about these programs. I mean, the Chinese state is ha rehousing millions of people. It's building all these museums, these cultural assets. Okay, their the budgets might be... You had various different ways of explaining how the budget was meager. So meager. <laughs> Um, but it, does, is China acting as a, a patron of architecture in the, the way that the West was for a social good? I think a small part of it, not all. I think there are good developers, just like with all other countries. There are good developers with good conscience, and we're facing a lot of them now. Uh, and obviously, there are greedy developers and absolutely uh, bad, I mean, developers that have absolutely no conscience. So I think that yeah. comes hand in I hand. Think, I think same with governments. I mean, you know, we, uh, we have been on export, um, expert uh, boards and expert uh, panels uh, judging really large, you know, uh, China, the Shanghai Opera House, um, the Shanghai Grand Theater. Uh, we participated in competitions for uh, the Shanghai uh, Design Museum or art museum. So, so we know how those things work. And I think particularly in Shanghai, we have been quite impressed over the past few years that the people who are taking part in that type of 
um, you know, mega cultural projects take it very seriously, and sometimes even more seriously than we have seen in the West. And, and we are surprised, and, and the kind of investment that they you know, put into uh, wanting, and the desire, and the intention to wanting to make um, and contribute to society through architecture and design. And back to the, the, the countryside part of the equation. Uh, also, Rem Kohlhaas and OMA have been very interested in the countryside. That's maybe the, the new thing for architects to kind of see that as, as everyone gets sucked into the cities, then the opportunities may be in what's being left behind. But how do you see that evolving in, in China? Because um, in the UK, for example, the, we still have um, villages where people live there. Okay, so they're, they're not the original inhabitants of the villages, but it's, it's wealthy people who commute, or it's, um, it's, there, there are no sort of massively depopulated places here. Do you see that life will return to the, the Chinese rural areas, or will it become like abandoned and, and, and nobody goes there? I, I think hopefully, obviously, we hope it will, things will change. And there, there is a concerted effort by the government not just to invest in major cities. Um, the, this is not, I don't believe it's just a propaganda, but the idea of going west and developing places um, in the middle of China is a real condition. You see it from the request of projects coming to our office. All of a sudden, you don't see as many projects in Shenzhen, Shanghai, or Beijing. The first but tier cities become yeah, the, the second and the third Now, all of a sudden, the second cities. and third cities are calling us, funded by uh, many of the projects funded by the government. So you, there, this is, there's a real movement. And we're not just the only architectural uh, practice that's dealing with all these requests. We were stunned, actually, because we, we had the first year of um, Design Awards last year. Rosanna, you were thankfully one of the judges. But the housing award was won by uh, a Chinese architect who we actually then couldn't get in touch with to get them to come to the ceremony. <laughs> and it was a, it was a village for, that had been built with um, government support for farmers in this really remote area. And architecturally, it was amazing. And actually, when we were, I was in the, the room when we were judging this, and... Um, all these prestigious architects that had come together to judge couldn't quite believe that there was this amazing housing being provided for farmers in a province we'd never even heard of. Mm. And they thought maybe it was fake. Mm. But it's for real, right? Mm. That there really is that care and attention being lavished on farmers. Mm. Certain cases, yes. You know, it's it, definitely not all. But um, I have to say, judging from a lot of the things that we have seen, um, there, I think there could be an opportunity for the villages to be revived, particularly in the digital era. That we have to remember, Marcus, in this village area, there is that capability and that ability to do good work. You have to remember there are layers and throughout histories, uh, many of people in their 70s even or in their 80s that actually can, the people that were doing those bricklaying in Yang, so they were literally in their 80s and 70s. So they do have a knowledge. Now it's very different. Uh, it's a bit on the rougher side. And every time I come to Stockholm, I love one of my favorite building is Leverance's Church, right? They do that very well with big mortar, you know, solid mortar and brick with a concrete thing. Um, and that's something in a world of precision oftentimes in the West is no longer accepted. But if you look at Leverance's work, it could be in the countryside in, in, in China. Now, conceptually, Caruso St. John writes beautifully about that, uh, the abstraction of the brick, that it no longer, you know, the tectonic of it becomes this one wall, and it's very beautifully written. But that same text could be described in many of the rural, current rural projects without architects, let alone having architects with sensi sensitivity coming in and start to experiment some of these sort of tectonics and quality and how it can be done. I was going to say that the 10, 15 years ago, everyone thought that um, cities would become less popular places to live because of technology. This idea of telecommuting or telecottaging, we were all going to be you know, opening our, our kitchen windows and hearing the birds singing and, and working on our laptops. <laughs> but actually, technology has made happening. people want to be, we're all sitting emailing the person that's one meter away from ourselves. It's very sad, isn't it? But I think didn't uh, just two weeks ago, the, one of the uh, big four arc, um, accounting firms in Hong Kong, 
they announced that starting, I don't know what months this year, they're um, they're going to they're going to stop people showing up in the office. Everyone is going to work from home. So I think that's one of the first announcements I've heard, and there's probably going to be a lot more to come. One of the trends I noticed walking around the fair here is the the kind of the the explosion of those kind of little glass office pods that you put within the office. So yes, we were interviewed in one of those yesterday uh, for the whole day. You were so in there for a whole day? Yes, from since like 8 in the morning. <laughs> and Did they lock you in? <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> no it is, I mean, we've, we've gone on to a different topic now, but for, for a while everyone was taking out the cubicles in offices, putting everyone in together into these open plan spaces, and now everyone's putting the little glass micro-architecture back in so that people can, I guess, concentrate Const and take yeah. away the, the dinner. So anyway, just to, to, to wrap up now, uh, what's next for you guys? Um, you, you're saying that if you'd started your practice today, you wouldn't stand a chance, but you're still kind of the, I was going to say elder statesman then, but you're still pretty young, but you're the, the definitely the, 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 the flag flyers for a kind of uh, sensibility and a, and a talent from a, another part of the world. But where do you, what are you doing next? Where are you looking to? There was this article that talked about uh, both Rezana and myself as reluctant ambassador for Chinese designer. Uh, to a certain extent, that is true, uh, because I think um, we're, we're here as practicing architects, interior designers, and product designers rather than ambassador, because being ambassador takes a lot of time and effort, and we're not very good at it. Um, but since no one is protecting the rights of many of these young designers, we end up speaking on their behalf. So a lot of, for instance, there are maybe nine or ten studios that, have came, that came out of our practice that's doing interior and architect. A lot of them featured in your, in, in, in design. And there are probably seven product design studio. You know, it's, it, I, we can't help it. We want to make sure that they are uh, doing well. And so oftentimes I would check and when we don't do projects, we want to make sure they take those projects because I'm so afraid that they're just going to die uh, from no, no work or exhaustion or this whole political scenario that they have to deal with. Um, but if you ask us what we're going to do in the next 10 years, I think we're going to have a concerted effort to teach. So we've made a commitment um, uh, to spend more time teaching. In Shanghai? To um, Chinese students? We, we are or now talking confidentially uh, in, in <laughs> Shanghai. <laughs> Just between in us, right? Shanghai, <laughs> There's a live stream right in, now. In Shanghai, we are, now, we are now talking very seriously uh, in a program that we're about to lead. Uh, but we have made commitments um, to two schools in the US. Yeah, but I think I, I want to um, emphasize that you know, teaching isn't just teaching. Teaching is also learning. And it's not just the teacher teaching the students, but really the students teaching the teachers as well. And, uh, and it's in some ways uh, part of what we do in the office. And in the office, we run our office like studios. So, you know, it's going to desk crits and working with people on their designs, the different teams. And when we teach studio, it's very similar. You said, you said that you were reluctant ambassadors, but you're talking about this new generation. So maybe you are, should be proud godparents of a whole new generation very proud, of very proud. Chinese yes. talent. Very proud. Yeah. I think that's a good note to end on. Rosanna and Lyndon, thank you ever so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. And can't wait to have another conversation in 10 years or even in one year, given the pace of change in China. Thank you very much. Thank you.